Indonesia is heading to the polls this Wednesday in what's being called one of the biggest days in global democracy. Now, the polls will consist of two simultaneous elections, one for the president and vice president pair, the other for members of parliament, governors, regents and mayors. Now, more than 200 million people are eligible to vote and that makes Indonesia the world's third biggest democracy behind the U.S., and India. 5.7 million volunteers have been mobilized to oversee around 820,000 polling stations all across the country. And on the legislative front, hundreds of thousands of candidates from 18 political parties are competing for more than 20,000 positions. The parties include Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle, or PDIP, led by former President Megawati Sukarnaputri, Party of Functional Groups or Golka, Great Indonesia Movement Party or Garindra, led by Defence Minister and Presidential Candidate Prabowo Subianto, National Democratic Party or NASDEM, and National Awakening Party or PKB, led by Vice Presidential Candidate Mohaimin Iskandar. Now, Indonesians will have to choose more than 2,700 provincial parliament members more than 17,500 Regency-level parliament members, 128 senators and 580 members of the House of Representatives. On the presidential front, locals will have to decide among these three candidates, former Jakarta Governor Anis Baswedan, who is running with Mohaimin Iskandar, Defence Minister Prabowo Subianto with Gibran Rakabuming Raka as his running mate, as well as former Central Governor Ganja Pranowo, who is running with Mahfud MD. Now, voters will be given either four or five ballot papers to pick the party or candidate of their choice. They will be given a nail to poke a hole in the ballot paper before dipping their finger in ink as a precaution against a voter fraud. They'll only have six hours to vote. Polls opening at 7 a.m. local time and closing at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Unofficial results will trickle in hours after the close of voting. But the official numbers will only come in by the 20th of March. Now, the presidential candidates need a simple majority of votes to win if no one secures more than half of the votes and at least 20 percent of the votes in over half of Indonesia's provinces. A runoff election will be held between the top two candidate pairs. The campaigning period for the runoff race will begin at the start of June and the final vote will happen on the 26th of that month. The winner of that round will take office in October. Newly elected national representatives will be inaugurated on the 1st of that month, while President Joko Widodo and Vice President Maruf Amin will make way for the new ruling pair on the 20th of October. Well, of the three candidates vying to succeed President Joko Widodo, Prabowo Subianto is said to be ahead of his younger rival, Ganja Pranowo, as well as Anis Baswedan. They have, there have been plenty of promises, but also plenty of controversy in the campaigns. For more on the elections, let's go back to CNA's Lokwesu speaking to us live from Jakarta. She is joined by Dr. Yanua Nugroho, a visiting senior fellow from the Indonesia Studies Program at ICS Yusuf Rishak Institute, as well as Arya Fernandez, head researcher at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Oh, thanks for that, Jill. And welcome, gentlemen, to our studio in Jakarta. Thank you. Yeah, thank now, you. we just heard Jill there saying, uh, well, uh, President Joko Widodo and his vice president will make way for the new ruling pair on the 20th of October. Are things ever so simple in Indonesia? I think uh, we're facing right now the difficult situation when Mr. Prabowo can, could not run for the election because of, uh, based on our constitu constitution, it's only served for two terms. And now he endorsed... Uh, Mr. Widodo. Mr. Pr yeah, Mr. Pr uh, Widodo cannot run for election because of constitution. And now he, he endorsed Mr. Prabowo, his minister of defense, and pairing with his sons, Gibran Rukabumi Muraka. Has he officially endorsed Mr. Prabowo, to be fair? Absolutely. Yeah, has to he? some extent, we can, we can see that he, he endorsed... Uh, Prabowo. And you are laughing. Well, <laughs> because I think uh, it's never uh, official. 
but I think everything leading to the advancement of Gibran to be the uh, vice president candidates uh, reveal uh, what what happened. I think. Okay, and Gibran, I the eldest son of President Joko Widodo, mm. and we very quickly. Oh, not that quickly, actually. Let's outline how this happened. October 16th, mm -hmm. the Constitutional Court ruled, made an exception for him to say that despite the fact that he did not hit 40 years of age, yep. he yep. had run in a regional office, therefore he qualified to run for vice president. Yep. And of course, that in itself, Mr. Widodo said, my children can choose anything they want. I'm not getting in their way. But what was worrying was everything else we've seen, including other members of his family. One of you yeah, talk about that. Yeah, I think he's trying to, to build political empire with endorsing his son as a running man of Prabhu Subianto and then maybe to some extent um, what, uh, Kai Sang is the head of uh, PSI party. Kai Sang is his second Kai son. Kai is his second son and then his son-in-law, uh, Bobby. Mayor of, so uh, of let's, Medan. Let's take a look at the family tree of Joko yeah. Widodo. Both sons plus son-in-law now mm. actively involved in politics, two of them becoming mayors in 2021, despite having relatively little experience in politics. Yeah. While Joko Widodo is still sitting president. Does that make a difference? Well, I think uh, that's uh, clearly uh, to me. Uh, uh, if you want to, if if you want to build political dynasty, and that's Blatan, I think he is. I don't know in another country uh, if it happens, but perhaps Pak Joko Widodo is the only sitting president at the moment when uh, his son and his son-in-law is the leader, subnational government leader. I think. I think he is. He hit the advantages as the president <clears throat> with the greater authority and then. Uh, with uh, a lot of resources politically and financially and then control a um, uh, majority of the parliament seats he can control everything and he can for example he he can he can speak with the with the political party elites and then try to negotiate with the his his future uh, political uh, agenda all right uh, can i add something yeah. uh, i think even if even if uh, he is sort of allowed to use that resources, sort of. But then you mentioned the uh, ruling of the uh, Constitutional Court, which was chaired by his own uncle. I think what... So it's Joko Widodo's brother-in-law. Brother-in-law, basically. Gibran's right? uncle. <clears throat> Gibran's uncle. So uh, if, I, if, if I want to make my, my, my point clear, perhaps it is not about the law, uh, black on white. But it is about ethical conduct, and I can say that that's unethical. Not just ethics. Yeah. I think the the the, mm. the 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 suggestion was that so Ke Sang, the second son, mm. in September, on Saturday became member of a party. Yeah. By Monday, Monday, he became yeah. chief yeah. of that yes. party. Yeah, yeah. Three party. weeks later, you've got the constitutional court ruling exactly. allowing his elder brother yeah. to run for VP. So. I'll, I'll, I'll ask both of you, if you run through what's happened since, say, 2018, the changes in the laws, the curbs of independent checking institutions, the use of institutions and the AG office to persuade, let's put it this way, yes. coalitions to form in ways that benefit some parties more than others. Each one of you, can you can you sum it up so that we get this picture? Individually, mm. each move is innocuous. Taken together, they suggest something. Let's start with you, Mr. I think Aya. this is the test for our democracy, whether our democracy will getting better or worse. And I think uh, Joko Widodo tried to uh, use his power to negotiate with, with all party, and we know that we don't have a good uh, opposition party at the parliament because uh, Mr. President uh, dominated with majority in the parliament. We don't have like a, a, a parliamentary watchdog who can control our executive, and we, we, we think that after this election, it uh, maybe our parliament should be higher, more more control to the put to the executive power, and. Um, Let's see what, what the final result, and I, I believe that after this election, our legislative power will be higher compared to the previous one. If I put it this way, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, in the second period of uh, President Joko Widodo, particularly, I think what is absent is the is the contestation of ideas. What merely happened was the uh, fight for interest. And this is reflected from the parties, the coalition of parties behind him. To put it bluntly, there is no check and balances because he controlled the parliament. Yeah. All parties become his supporter. But you know, arguably, if I were the president yep. and I want things to go my yeah, way, sure. it is in my interest to control everything. So you've got nine parties in parliament, yes. seven are in his coalition, yep. so 82% like yeah. of the seats yes. are his. Yeah. Right? So the two that are not the opposition, Nasdem and PKS, yes. yes? Yeah. They and, and, don't and make as much of an opposition. But, but it's not Mr. Widodo's fault that the opposition in Indonesia is so badly so, institutionalized. Yeah. And so organized. we have to evaluate <laughs> our, yeah. our uh, uh, political party system because we don't have, no, party don't have a lot of, uh, 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 huge money to run for uh, f for political mobilization. We uh, there is no uh, s uh, state subsidy for political parties, and political parties don't have a lot of money to run for their for the campaign, for example, for political education, for political socialization. So the party needs to join the cabinet to access for pork barrel program, and so we do uh, effectively distributed all pork program to each his political party coalition like for example Gorkar he he give he give Gorkar with the uh, what uh, job uh, Go, creation Gorkar card, wanted yeah. to support Anis Basbiden but somehow across the months it edged over to propose Subianto is, is that is, is that just rumor mm, i think no if, yes. for, for, from the beginning he, he Gorkar tried to support Prabowo uh, i think what happened was uh, you're right that it's not uh, Djokovic's uh, fault uh, that that he he could, of course, that he could uh, accumulate power, right, uh, in, in, in the parliament to support him. But I think what is missing here is that you can you can uh, point fingers at the uh, party or the political uh, system in, in Indonesia. But what happened is that again the check and balance is is absent. So, if I put bluntly again. The president can act as if it is a tyranny. He can do anything without protest. He can do anything. There is no check and balance, even from civil society, mm -hmm. who became, I would say, uh, fragmented. So there is no real uh, check and balance in terms of power. And I think this is what I would say as unhealthy in the mm -hmm. political system, uh, like in Indonesia, I think. I may be wrong. but. Then who, whose business is it to make sure that democratic principles, which actually is a fairly fuzzy notion, but yes, it I probably know. does include an active opposition, yes. independent checking institutions such as the Corruption, Anti-Corruption mm -hmm. Commission, yep. such as the Constitutional Court, yep. these things should be checking the actions. Whose business is it in Indonesia to make sure that these things are up and running? Well, uh, the commission of, uh, for the eradication of corruption, as you mentioned, was weakened. The the law was changed. Uh, you know, then the uh, the dynasty politics uh, leading up to the uh, appointment of uh, Jokowi's uh, young brother, younger brother-in-law, mm -hmm. became the the uh, the chairman. I think if you if you look at as a single or isolated uh, incident, that, 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 that should be like, oh, it looked okay, it looks okay, right? But then when you put together uh, as a picture, then you will see that uh, this all would lead to something that now I think what we see today. When then people, maybe they are late to realize this, or maybe they already realized in the beginning but they didn't dare to say, because at the time they were still believed in Pak Jokowi, uh, that he would do something something good, but then now apparently, with all the protests you 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 see more than two hundred uh, universities, even today in, in my hometown in Jogja, uh, I'm from Jogja in my hometown, more than two thousand uh, students uh, gathered in the street protesting not against Pak Prabowo but against Pak Jokowi. Why Pak Jokowi let this uh, situation happen? 
So I think, again, if we look uh, at those uh, incidents as an isolated uh, event, then what's wrong with this? Why I, I cannot do this as a patient? But then if you put all together, then you will see what constitutes uh, the problems of Indonesia's democracy today. That's what I think. All right. Uh Final question to you, and then Miss yeah, Arya. Yeah. Now, uh, I, 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 I will play devil's advocate uh, and, and, and support Mr. Widodo on this one. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'll say that he never, apart from the standard comments that any leader makes about commitment to human rights, commitment to democracy, never pretended that he was a huge believer in the abstract notion of democracy. But it's just that when we looked at him, this very humble furniture seller coming up really from the roots, he is the He's the poster child, the beneficiary <laughs> of reformacy, okay? So we expected him to then pay respect to reformacy and to build it up and say, well, this gave me my chance. I will now mm -hmm. give everyone who wants to go through that route a chance. But you don't think he did? No. I think we can have Pak Jokowi as president exactly because we fought for democracy. If we look back to what happened in 1998, the reform, the reform, what happened at that time was that we, like we self-corrected ourselves, you know, uh, from the president that can be uh, in the position for basically uh, forever. And then we changed, we limited into two periods. Mm -hmm. And we let this direct election to happen. I would say that Pak Jokowi is the born child of the democracy that we fought in 1998. Of course, as you said, there is no obligation from him, right, to, to, to uphold that principle. But to me, this is really, really, uh, if I put the word betrayal to that uh, reform because it is the democracy that uh, made possible someone like him, who was no one. Of course, he was a mayor from Solo, but the way he, he went through his ca career, uh, advanced into a governor and then uh, elected as president. But now, what he is doing, I think, with advancing Gibran, advancing uh, uh, Kaisang in this, I think, I don't know how, how to put it in word. Mm -hmm. Uh, except the, uh, if I use the word uh, betrayal to the All right. democracy. Do you, do you agree betrayal, yes or no, very quickly? Yeah, I think this is like the test for our democracy and maybe our democracy now is under threat, under the threat. And uh, again, we have to, yeah, this election, it will be tomorrow and we have to make sure that this is peaceful election with uh, to ensure the political stability and that needs for for Day after this tomorrow. Month. Yeah, the day after tomorrow, yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks so much for that. Uh, Dr. Yanwa Nuguro, uh, Visiting Senior Fellow of Indonesian Studies Program, ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute, and you as well, Dr. Mr. Aya Fernandez, Head Department of Politics and Social Change Organization from CSIS. Thanks so much for coming this evening. Thank you.